Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming to uh, my TED Talk. Just joking. Thank you so much for coming to the presentation. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to talk to you about Mifflin Worcester Gibbs. Uh, he is somebody that I did not know about until maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, at the front desk, there are lots of retired teachers and people who have been in the education field, and we kind of try and pride ourselves on trying to discover Arkansas history and uh, kind of unveiling what has happened here in this building. So uh, one day, I just came across Mifflin Gibbs, didn't know anything about him. Um, however, his history has stood, and it's still a valid and a significant conversation. And again, I'm honored to be able to present what I've come to know and what I think I understand about Mifflin Gibbs. So, and oh, conversation, by way of conversation, I mean, um, I really wanted to sit down and talk about this, and I really wanted you to kind of have a sense of basically not me being an expert on the topic, but us talking about it, um, me sharing with you uh, what I've come to understand. Okay. So. so, who was Mifflin Gibbs? Uh, why are we talking about Mifflin Gibbs in Black History Month? What has Mifflin Gibbs contributed to the American conversation? What has he uh, contributed to Arkansas? Um, Little Rock and even the Old State House Museum. Uh, that, that are some of the, those are some of the questions that we're going to talk about today. Um, but I'm going to start when Mifflin came to Arkansas. Okay. Uh, Mifflin encounters Arkansas in 1872, in 1871. Okay. Uh, he comes here after leaving um, Oberlin College, graduating with his law degree. Uh, around the early 1870s, of course, this was Reconstruction time in the South in America. And Mifflin, having had uh, encountered uh, a lot of racism in his past, but also a lot of success as a black man, was in a unique position. So I believe it was his thought process to come to the South to help with reconstruction uh, the best way he knew how. Uh, Mifflin is touring the South in 1871, 1870, trying to figure out exactly where he wants to go. Where is he going to settle? Mifflin has a brother uh, by the name of, of Jonathan Clarkson, I'm sorry, Jonathan yeah, Clarkson um, Gibbs in Florida. Okay? His, his brother is doing great work in Florida. He is a representative uh, in Florida. By this time, he's done lots of things to advance African Americans um, in the community, in the state that he was in. Uh, he invites Mifflin to come and be with him. But Mifflin, being the type of man that he was, wanted to rest on his own laurels and not those of his brother. So in, 17, in 1871, he goes to South Carolina, and he's at a Freedmen's Bureau, and he has a discussion with some of the representatives from the House of Representatives here in Arkansas. Um, he runs into Richard Dawson, uh, J.H. Johnson, um, William Gray, and they encourage him to come to Arkansas. At that time, Arkansas was known as the land of opportunity for black people. Uh, it was kind of the wild, um, wild open, wide open west um, for a lot of African American, a lot of African Americans at that time. So he decides to come to Arkansas. He comes to Arkansas May 1871, and he immediately um, admits to the Arkansas bar. So during his time um, with the bar, throughout the bar pos, bra, bar process, excuse me, throughout the bar process, he gets to know a lot of Republicans, a lot of white Republicans in the state of Arkansas. And he uh, almost immediately gets uh, united with them and joins up with, with them. Uh, shortly thereafter, Mifflin joins a, a, well, he joins the partnership with Lloyd Willer, uh, who was a, a lawyer, a black lawyer. Um, as a matter of fact, As a matter of fact, their partnership, their law firm, was known as Wheeler and Gibbs. And it is recorded that it was located on the corner of Markham and Center Street. Okay. If you guys know anything about Markham and Center Street, it's right outside the front doors here um, of the Old State House Museum. So I'm not sure if it was on this corner or this corner, but it was in the old bank here. Um, they were pretty successful because there weren't a lot of black law firms at the time. But they practiced law there. Also, Mifflin took uh, an opportunity to practice um, real estate there as well. So there was, it was also a real estate agency. Excuse me. 
As he is practicing law, he is also assigned to be the attorney for Pulaski County. So he becomes the attorney for Pulaski County. Um, he's doing good work, but he is intrigued by a position that opens up. Um, there is an opportunity to be a municipal judge in Little Rock. So Mifflin decides that he is going to run for that position. He was actually um, nominated by the Republican Party to run for the position of municipal judge. Um, Mifflin says yes, he goes forth with it, he campaigns, he actually has a rally on the front steps of the Old State House Museum, and he is successful, he edges out his competition marginally, but he did win. At that point, I'm not sure if Arkansas was aware of the fact that it had elected the first black municipal judge in America, but it had indeed done that. Um, that was significant for Mifflin for a number of reasons. Again, he wanted to come to the South to help with reconstruction, to help with the advancement of, Afri of African Americans, but it, it was also um, the first time he was elected by a body that wasn't necessarily African Americans. It was a diverse set of peers uh, that helped elect him to that position. Uh, but this was not Mifflin's first foray into politics. Mifflin gets here, I tell you, in the early 1870s, but Mifflin, uh, by this time, has been to California, has been to uh, Canada as well. In Canada, he is elected, he's the first black elected councilman um, in British Columbia. He is um, known in the community as a, not just an informal leader, um, but an, a successful man and somebody uh, that could be trusted. So he brings to the table um, more experience than I think uh, probably people were aware of at that time. So not only does he serve as, as the judge here um, in, excuse me, as a municipal judge here in Arkansas, he does that from between 73, uh, 1974 to 1975. But during that time, he's still practicing law, practicing law and uh, he and his partner Wheeler have the opportunity to try a case um, against a bartender in the local area. Uh, three of the representatives, from our, three black representatives from the House of Representatives, uh, House of Representatives here in, our, in the Old State House Museum uh, were not served in the bar. The barkeeper re refused service to them. So um, they decide that they are going to um, sue this man. So they sue the bartender and he wins, or they win the case for him, citing it uh, based on the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And that was one of the first cases in the state, said the president. Um, and that was well before civil rights were um, being enforced in the country um, at that time. So Gibbs is somewhat of a force to be reckoned with already, um, but I will go back to his, um, his time in, in Canada and talk about um, some of the work that he did direct, that directly connects him to his time in Arkansas. Uh, Mifflin was a, excuse me, an, an enterprising man. He had a retail store. He um, also was an investor for money that he made while he was in California. Okay? Um, from, from the time in California, he was able to to witness what was happening with the, the gold rush, okay? Let me, let me put a pin in that, let me go back. I'm sorry guys, let me, let me put a pin in that. Um, and I'll go back to his time in, let's start his, at his time in Philadelphia, okay? So uh, Mifflin was born in 1823, okay? Uh, his parents were Maria and Jonathan Gibbs, and um, they're pretty well-to-do people. His father is a Wesleyan Methodist preacher, okay? um, but by the time Mifflin is eight years old, his father passes away. Excuse me. That meant that he and his older brother, Jonathan, would not be able to attend school anymore. Okay? They decide to work and take care of the family. One of the first jobs that Mifflin gets is uh, he becomes a driver for a, a white doctor. Um, and by the way, he was born to free parents. He was a free man. They were never in, in an enslaved family. 
Um, and while he was on one of the routes with the, uh, with the white doctor, he witnessed a slave, a, a young black boy. And um, it is recorded that he commented on the robotic nature of the young man and the, and the work that, um, that he did, the harsh nature of it, uh, was something that struck him and stuck with him throughout his life. Um, it was kind of the beginning of something that would help Mifflin um, drive his drive and uh, to, to fuel his drive and passion to help African Americans. So here on the top, um, you see the Underground Railroad. Eventually, Mifflin gets involved with the Underground Railroad. Um, he uh, actually helped slaves escape. Philadelphia was a city that was popu a popular place along the route uh, to the Underground Railroad for African Americans to escape to, uh, being that they had a large black free community. It was a place where they could kind of blend in. So uh, he assisted, pe assisted people on the Underground Railroad. He also had an um, opportunity to have a conversation with um, a gentleman by the name of Sinke from the Amistad, Amistad ship in the Amistad case of illegal slave trading. And that conversation also inspired him quite a bit. Um, Mifflin is working in the daytime. He and his brother are carpenter, uh, are training to be carpenters. So in the daytime they're doing the work, but at nighttime they join the Philadelphia Library Society. Um, Society. And it basically that was a group of African American men who talked about current affairs and the advancement of African Americans and particularly, particularly abolition. Uh, so at nighttime he's learning as much as he can. Um, it is it's clear he is a person that values education. Um, he starts to speak out on these issues and he becomes affiliated with Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass and Mifflin Gibbs forge a relationship, a friendship, um, and he is invited by Frederick Douglass to start touring on the abolitionist tour. Uh, so he's touring in West, Western New York. He's doing a good work, working hard, still trying to support his family. Uh, by the way, it's reported that he has, uh, there are four, of the, four children, some say uh, that there were three children, but that it was his oldest brother, it was him, and we know that there was one by the name of Isaac, in any event. So he's helping to take care of his mother as well. She was um, a laundress, and uh, also she was noted to be um, an invalid. So there's a lot of responsibility on his back. By this time, Mifflin is in his 20s, um, and he's doing work that he's satisfied with, but he wants more. Um, this is close to 1850, and the gold rush happens in California. Mifflin decides that he's gonna go for something more. He's gonna leave Philadelphia, he's gonna leave the New York speaking route, and he's, he's going to save all his money and go to California. Actually, um, he borrowed a lot of money from his friends. <laughs> that was one way he gained support to be able to get to to California. He takes a steamship from New York uh, because the route was, the one route was from New York to Panama and from Panama to California. Uh, it was a lot safer, but it was definitely more expensive. It was a lot safer than going from New York um, all the way to California per land, uh, per state side, because of slavery, because of maybe Native American issues or troubles he might encounter uh, as a black man. So. Anyway, Mifflin set sail, and he arrives in Panama. While he's in Panama, he thinks it's taking too long for the, the second ship to arrive. He's gonna take a shortcut, so to speak. He goes through Panama, which was a jungle at that time. Uh, he gets bitten by a snake. He's <laughs> riding on mules. He has to nurse himself. Um, he gets a fever. Basically, that trip ended up taking him five weeks to get to California. When he gets to California, he has about 60 cents to his name. Some reports say that he has about 10 cents to his name. So he's in California, he lands in San Francisco, and um, he, had high, he had high hopes for himself. Um, but the same racism that he encountered that kind of limited him in the west, northwestern part of the country also met him in California. Um, it was the case that, that white men would get claims to the better and bigger portions of area where more gold had been found and black men were, um, they were left to go to areas that were very dangerous and rough. So um, he and some black men, they work together, they're still successful, people are finding gold, but Mifflin finds the work too dirty. 
he doesn't like panning, okay? <laughs> um, he decides uh, that he is going to open up a, sh a, sh a store, a retail store, and he focuses on he focuses on shoes and boots. Okay, so he's a he's a boot man. Um, he's doing very well there, uh, selling these shoes, and the business as it takes off. Mifflin is going to Paris to get these fine materials. He's going to London, um, and he's going to Panama. He's traveling to support his store. So he's in the money. He quickly finds success. Well, not quickly. It took took a little bit, but he found success um, at at a at a high rate once he did find it. Um, he works with another gentleman, and they find a pa found a paper. Okay. Mirror of the Times, I don't know if you can see it right here in the corner. Um, some, reports that, uh, some reports say that this is the first uh, black newspaper on the Pacific coast. Some say that it's the second, but either way we know it is an early uh, newspaper um, by, an, by a couple of African American editors. So Mirror of the Times talked about, a current, talked about current affairs, it talked about resources for African Americans, it talked about what was happening throughout the country um, and within the community as well. So Mifflin is rising to be not just a successful businessman, but he is also rising to be a, a voice uh, for the voiceless and a leader in the community. So here on the left, you see that's the, the name of his, the sign of the, the sign outside of his store, Pioneer Boot and Shoe Emporium. Lester and Gibbs, importers and dealers, and they're in, in San Francisco. Uh, Mifflin was ahead of his time. I'm going to read a list of his contributions and um, or his contributions to society, his achievements. But one thing that I learned is he was almost like uh, almost like Jeff Bezos in a sense. Um, he connected with Wills Fargo to, if people, wanted, uh, if people wanted an order, you could go through Wills Fargo to help with the delivery. And I thought, wow, how ingenious was that way in the uh, 1850s, 1860s? So there's Mifflin. Um, Mifflin is doing good in California, but he's tired of the racism. By this time, California is becoming very strict on black people, and in, essentially they're trying to push all the black people out. Uh, there was one one idea where California wanted to uh, make it illegal for black people to come to California and be in California. Um, there was also a rule that said, or law that said that black people could not testify against white people in criminal or civil suits. Uh, the black children had to be removed from the school. So pe black people were feeling a pinch. Uh, another opportunity arises. But before that, the black leaders in the community get together and talk about their next plan. What are they going to do to get out of this environment? They discuss going to, to Mexico. They even discuss going to Panama. But gold, the gold rush struck in uh, Canada, in British Columbia. So Mifflin heads up to, to Canada, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and the, the Vancouver Island. And he, having had the experience of being in a, uh, an area where there's a, a gold rush and a mine, decides that he's going to start selling the supplies needed for workers who are in, in gold mines. And he is quickly successful. Within a month, um, he more than triples his profits. He's doing very well. He decides to invest his money. He invests his money in, um, he invests his money in construction. And some of his construction workers or his firm then proceed to build the first railroad in, uh, in Vancouver. He was also into real estate. Um, he had many of houses. As a matter of fact, here on the corner, that's where, that's in, in Victoria, British Columbia, that's where his house used to be, and that's where he, his wife, who I'll talk to in just a second, Maria, raised their five children. Um, it is also up for discussion, or there are conflicting accounts about how many children Mifflin and Maria had. Um, some say six, some say five. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, while he is in California, I'm sorry, in Canada, he is highly successful again. That's when he uh, becomes a councilman. He is voted. Uh, Canada calls him, 
I believe the first black elected uh, politician in Canada and the third black elected politician in North America. So this is all before he's in Little Rock. This is a bit of the backstory or part of his story. In 1859, um, Gibbs decides that it's time for him to get married. Okay. By this time, he's in his 30s. It's time for him to settle down and have a family. So he goes back to, he goes back to Ohio. He goes to, to the, um, the northwest corner of the country. And he marries Maria Alexander Gibbs, this lady right here. Uh, one thing I can say about Mifflin, even though poverty struck his family early in his childhood, uh, he was still among, uh, considered to be among an elite class. So money could get you into an elite class, but pedigree uh, couldn't be argued with, even if your, your uh, economic status wasn't as high as some others were outside of that class. So uh, Maria was a part of that um, elite class, Maria Ann Alexander Gibbs. She is the daughter of Lucy Chen, and it is rumored and uh, strongly believed that she is the daughter of former Vice President Johnson, Robert Johnson, so, which is a white man um, and vice president of, uh, former Vice President of the United States of America. Um, so the name um, Alexander carried a lot of weight for her and her children, uh, which we'll kind of discuss a little bit more in uh, here shortly too. So, you see here the first black newspaper on the Pacific Coast, Jonas H. Townsend and Mifflin Gibbs, co-editors of the Miracle Times. Okay, so this is the sign. Looks a lot like the sign that he had in California that he used outside his shop in Canada. Groceries, provisions, hardware, boots, shoes, and miners' outfits. Okay. This quote I found, again, he prospered first as a merchant, then as a property developer, contractor, and elected politician. In 1866, Gibbs was elected to the Victoria British Columbia City Council, becoming the second black of official in Canada and only the third elected anywhere on the North American continent, but the first in Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver Island. Okay. Canada lays a, a, a great deal of claim to Mifflin Gibbs as well. He was there um, for quite some time, for about a decade or so, and he made lots of contributions to the African American advancement. So, okay, thank you so much. Yes. Did I say who Lester and Gibbs were? Yeah. You said Lester and Gibbs. Who was that? Lester and, let me go back. That was his um, business partner. He had a store with um, Mr. Gibbs. Okay. But the, the, since the night is on by the mm -hmm. California store and the Canada store, mm -hmm. does that mean he made Gibbs his business? Yes, they took the business up. Yes, ma'am. They took the business up. You're welcome. Um, but I was saying that Canada lays a great deal of claim to Mifflin as well. Um, so you can see um, here on this document, on this not document, but on this monument to him. Uh, they talk about Mifflin and his contributions, his importance in trade. He's revered as a historical figure in the province since African-Canadian community. Okay. So I'm going to take some time and I'm going to read to you because I don't want to cheapen his, um, his contributions. Okay. Uh, a list of things that he, is, he did for while he was in Arkansas. And I'm going to pick up right after he got elected. Okay, in 1874. Uh, Gibbs is appointed to attorney for Pulaski County shortly after he, uh, he gets here. He resigns from the position once he becomes circuit judge. He serves as circuit judge from November, excuse me, November 1874 to April 1875. Um, he also played a part in the Brooks-Baxter War. I don't know if you guys know about the Brooks-Baxter War. It's a complicated, convoluted story, but basically um, Brooks and Baxter were running for governor and Baxter won, but it is said that it was a corrupt election and Brooks fought for the position. And when I say fought, I mean he gathered some soldiers some, and physically removed Baxter out of the building with his administration and they battled in 1874. So um, Clayton Powell, 
or yes, Powell Clayton, excuse me, went to, went to Gibbs and asked him to sign a search warrant authorizing the state militia to intercept a duplicate of the state seal that was en route to Baxter. Okay. Um, that state seal, that fake state seal was going to allow Baxter to change rules and laws quicker than he actually did um, <laughs> soon after everything was over with. Okay. In 1885, he represents Arkansas at the 1885 Louisiana World Expo. Throughout the 1880s, Gibbs was a member of the Board of Visitors of the Little Rock School System. Okay. Uh, he practiced his law again. He, he's never quite out of the law field. Um, that was something that was consistent from the time he, he got his law degree in Oberlin. Uh, but in, 18, in 1877, he's practicing again. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, for a short time, but he was then appointed by President Hayes as Register of the United States Land Office for the Little Rock District of Arkansas in, in 1877. Okay. Uh, between 1889 and 1897, Gibbs becomes the receiver of public monies at Little Rock Land District appointed by President Harrison. Okay. Let me go back here. Okay. This is where am I? Okay, in the corner here. You guys recognize this building? It's across the street. Um, it is actually behind this brick building right here. That's where Mifflin then moved to uh, when he became a federal employee. So these roles, these appointed roles, is where he served in this in the um, old custom house, the old post office. So here, so he was never really quite far away from this area. Okay. What else? 1897, President McKinley, this is the third president, named Gibbs the U.S. Council to Tomatave or Tomasina, Madagascar, where he worked with not only the French, but the German governments as well. And while he was in Madagascar, he helped develop a railroad, something he had practice with because he had helped with the railroad, complete the railroad or develop the railroad in Vancouver, okay? However, there was some backlash, um, or maybe not backlash, but another side of things. Um, there's a term called clientage politics, which is kind of basically like being a, a token um, of a people. Uh, so it says a token to keep black people in line in exchange for personal socio and politi socio political gain um, that's what Mifflin was accused of. Um, it is said that he got these positions uh, as an example of what you can attain as an African American, but in exchange for that, he would have to keep the, the rest of the black Republicans in line. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's what was written, but that's not for me to decide. Um, but I will say in response to that, he was still a community leader here in Arkansas. He was often one to organize conventions of black men to discuss the political future of African Americans. He talked about the availability, availability of land and promoted it to the African American community. Um, he helped to conceptually develop industrial schools and funded them as well. Gibbs was a friend of Booker T. Washington, not just Frederick Douglass. Um, he was a friend of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington believed a lot in the industrial schools um, and black people working towards achieving some sort of financial success uh, by uh, pursuing vocations. Okay? And even today, one of his buildings is not too far from Booker T. Washington School. His daughter was very good friends with W.B. Du Bois. So this is the kind of company that his family kept. There was a school created, Gibbs High School, in Gibbs Elementary. Gibbs High School was where near Dunbar is today. Um, I think I may have a picture. I do have a picture. There it is, top. That's a picture of Gibbs High School, M.W. Gibbs High School. And there was an elementary school. The building was torn down at some point and uh, the elementary school as well. There was a, a convergence of streets that happened in that neighborhood. Uh, so things changed and shifted. However, there is a Gibbs Elementary today. Okay. 
Gibbs worked to bring awareness of the worsening violent conditions against African Americans in Arkansas uh, and in Washington, D.C. as well. Okay. As the Republican Party was losing its grip on Arkansas, things started to, and, and the Democrats got in charge, things started um, going downhill for African Americans. Um, there were a lot more killings, the KKK was rising. Um, the conditionings were worsening just from 1870 as the Reconstruction was kind of going to pot. Um, there were deaths here in Arkansas, uh, lynchings, and that was something that was, of course, a concern for Mifflin and other African American representatives. So they worked to bring awareness to the conditions that Arkansans were facing. Um, he would meet in D.C. as well to talk about the plight of um, not just Arkansas, but or the, or the black people in Arkansas, but just all over the country as well. I like to think that his, his, uh, his time on the Western tour with Frederick Douglass would contribute to his skill set in, in being able to deliver effective speeches. If you study Mifflin Gibbs, if you've studied him, you see where it's stated more times than not how eloquent of a speaker he is how powerful of a speaker he is. And if you've tried to read his autobiography, Shadow and Light, you will see how many words this man knew <laughs> and the art in which he took, um, the art and time in which he took to put his words together. Um, so Mifflin continued to help in the community in 1909. He created a Black Lawyers Auxiliary. It was called the National Negro Business League. Oh, by the way, down here under the Arkansas flag, this area, this little picture, Mifflin had a, um, a nursing home. It was called the, the Gibbs Nursing Home. Of course, there's nothing there now. It was off Center Street. So that's Center Street again. He was just not too far from here um, on, on many occasions. All right, Gibbs Elementary that stands um, here today, it's an international elementary school, magnet school, um, one of the higher ranked schools in, in Little Rock. Okay. If you know where Gibbs is, then you know where Mifflin Gibbs house is. His house still stands today. It's not in living condition, uh, but I'm impressed that it is still there. It's, it's standing up and, and Gibbs Elementary is right across the street from it. Down here at the bottom, you may recognize the, the monument. This lady is the niece of the great, maybe the great, great, or the great, 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 probably great, great, niece of Mifflin Gibbs. Her name is Verna Gibbs. And she did a lot as well. Um, well, she's still alive. She is a Harvard surgeon. She came up with one of the most, some, some unique form of medicine she created. She, um, created something, but basically she's on the record for something great um, in, you know, Gibbs style. His daughter, uh, Harriet Gibbs Marshall, oh, the four, four or five of his children graduated from Oberlin College, by the way. Um, but his daughter Harriet had a significant career, career of her own. Um, she was a musician. She opened up her own conservatory. Uh, even to, the, to this day, there is a music school dedicated to her. Okay. His daughter, Ida Gibbs Hunt, she was a Pan-Africanist, a teacher. Um, she taught for a while. She had a master's and a bachelor's and a master's in English. Okay. She went to Florida A&M College to teach to in Tallahassee. Um, what I will say about Florida A&M College, I mentioned his brother, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Gibbs, his oldest brother. His oldest brother uh, d did work in politics in Florida, uh, and he created a college there. He was instrumental in developing public schools in Florida. His son, Thomas, was a co-founder of Florida A&M. So here we have Ida teaching at the same school that her first cousin helped create. Okay. So in all, what I will say about Mifflin Gibbs, um, 
doing this presentation. I, his legacy is something that I think that we could, could learn a lot from. Um, he was a man that proved, it, 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 speaking personally for myself, he was a man that proved that you know the limits that we place on ourselves are only the limits that we place on ourselves. He smashed records, and I don't think he thought twice about if he was gonna be the first or the last to do it, but he did uh, good work that still stands um, today, and I'm grateful that I ran across this information here at the Old State House Museum. Uh, like I said, he, um, he wrote an autobiography, it's called Shadow and Light, if you wanna know more about his story in his own words as well, so. Mifflin dies in 1915. Okay. He's buried in Arkansas, though he is from Philadelphia. Uh, he had been here since 1971, so I've been told that we could claim him at that point. <laughs> but um, yes, he dies here after a long illness. But yeah. After his death, his legacy was, it was still important for the people in the community, like uh, Sisipio Jones and the other African-American representatives to take up the, the space that he left. And that was something that they were devoted to doing as well. So um, that's basically my part of what I've come to understand about Mifflin Gibbs. Okay, thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions, let me know.